We're going to get started. Um, so today's lecture is going to be on smart contract security. Uh, so we're going to talk about an overview of security in general on like Ethereum and uh, smart contracts, but then we're going to really take a deep dive into uh, how this code can be exploited. Uh, so I'll go through a lot of examples. Uh, there'll be like some uh, live testing even, and uh, then we'll cover a bit of quirks in the whole uh, Ethereum like uh, smart contract system, uh, which includes like assert statements, revert statements, stuff like that. And if we get to it, we'll cover uh, some hacking history of, uh, completely related to Ethereum again. Uh, this will be like the parity and like DAO hacks. What does security mean for blockchain? Uh, security can basically refer to preventing any kind of exploit on the protocol or application layers. Uh, when we think about protocol, we think about network nodes, uh, so Ethereum network nodes. And when we think about application, we think about uh, the clients on dApps, uh, basically having the exposure uh, to all the endpoints on the smart contract. So if you were to think as a, of a public blockchain, almost like a server, essentially it's server-sided code, which is like all public. And it's even like having your database like completely public. Um, how is this like different than like the current standard of like how people host their applications? Like Facebook, for example. Like what do they do differently? Any ideas? Yeah, you know. Yeah. 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 So, so basically, Facebook has a very centralized server. Uh, they manage all of like the user data. Uh, they have access to um, basically making things more performant as well. Uh, so there's a lot of trade-offs from using a public blockchain versus a database. We won't go into that too much in this lecture, but basically. Uh, security is quite a hassle to manage on public blockchains. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention with regards to blockchains is Ethereum versus Bitcoin, the Turing completeness of the EVM basically expands the attack surface on Ethereum greatly. Whereas you remember Bitcoin script was pretty primitive, no loops. Uh, Ethereum's Turing completeness basically allows you to run any kind of program which expands the entire space of what you can run on that system. So you can imagine that because of that, you know, it's much easier to find flaws. And by default, Turing complete systems are never secure. Nothing is truly secure, actually. So what's the reality here? Uh, Ethereum and other systems are very, very experimental. You know, it requires a very different philosophy behind developing applications on their system. Uh, there's a lot of instability. Uh, it's very similar to like hardware programming or financial services. It's not like mobile or web where things are very like sandboxed and uh, you know your applications are completely like uh, abstracted away from all the lower level stuff. There's a lot of flaws in the system that could potentially go wrong when you're dealing with smart contracts. People can drain millions from accounts that are uh, being used on the Ethereum blockchain if they find a flaw in your contract. And that's pretty crazy. Like people have made lots of money just just by like poking in at contracts and seeing what's wrong with them. People have also like destroyed access to like money by doing this. So like nobody gets nobody gets like the money uh, back from their contract. So even uh, exploits have happened from uh, contracts that have been developed by the best teams in the space, which include uh, like co-founder of Ethereum, uh, Gavin Wood. He wrote the Ethereum yellow paper. And if you've like take it, taken a look at that, you can tell he's a pretty smart guy. Uh, he's clearly like made his way through the industry. He's clearly been a pioneer of this whole thing. But even him uh, leading Parity Technologies, his, his new company, uh, building uh, a different uh, uh, alternative smart contract wallet as well as uh, Ethereum client, they managed to screw up as well. Because this, these systems are pretty complex and they're hard to manage and it's hard to write uh, secure code these days. There's changes being made to that, but they're not really quite in place yet, uh, but they're pushing for it. So let's take an example here. Suppose people have their own instances of a contract deployed, uh, like a multi-signature wallet. Uh, basically, if there's a bug, there is no way to govern that each person upgrades or self-destructs their contract into a, new in, into a new instance. 
So you must write secure code prior to deploying on the mainnet. Otherwise, you know, you're screwing people over. There's ways to kind of hack around this, but for the most part, um, you're like stuck with the code you have. So transitioning over to smart contract security. Smart contracts are available. Once they're deployed, you can't, get ch you can't change their code. Uh, and therefore, you cannot fix the bugs that are in the contract. You can deploy a new contract, but you know that old one that was deployed previously, if you have no way to transfer funds properly, uh, if you don't give power to users to uh, like upgrade their contracts, then people are basically screwed. Uh, so you can compare this to the current state of software engineering where uh, if you've interned at like an uh, interesting like large company, they have like continuous deployment, integration tests, they have a huge testing pipeline. But for, for smart contracts, it's, I'll, I'll show you, it's like very, it's very, very basic and primitive compared to uh, what they're doing in industry these days. But I think eventually uh, it, may, it may end up being the case where we do have continuous deployment, we do have integration tests. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out how to do this within uh, a decentralized distributed system uh, that's like public, um, and there's a huge desire for it to be immutable, so obviously that's tricky to do, right? So, the future might actually be, you know, whole organizations governed by smart contract code. I'm sure you've heard this vision before. Uh, so there's clearly a need for security. You can think of the current state of Ethereum as a Disneyland for hackers because, you know, there's, there's money stored in code that's stored on a public database essentially that people can poke at um, and if you find a flaw you can make a lot of money so this is a this is a reason why you should be looking for bugs on, uh, on Ethereum once you once uh, once you go through this whole uh, lecture so what's the solution here you know we could use better testing for smart contracts um, you may have heard that test driven development is never a guarantee of security but once again, nothing is ever truly secure. Formerly verifiable contracts, basically this means a mathematically uh, proven way to prove, uh, to show why a smart contract works. Uh, basically like you run uh, this like uh, formal verification like script and it goes over your contract and it tells you exactly like uh, what's wrong and why it's not going to execute correctly. But this requires a lot of overhead on the developer side because uh, with formal verification, you kind of have to write your smart contracts in a very uh, different way, um, and it's not really there yet in terms of uh, in terms of feasibility so much. There are tools available, but they're not quite uh, as accurate as we'd like them to be. There's also uh, the ability to do smart contract code audits. Um, you can make a lot of money if you know how to look for uh, flaws in smart contracts. If a lot of ICOs these days come to us at Blockchain and Berkeley as clients. Uh, basically, we audit their code for, for fun and uh, people get paid out and, and it's great. Uh, but there's a lot of shit on the line, so you better know what you're doing if you end up doing this. There's also uh, another solution, easier smart contract languages with safety built in. So Viper, which is going to be the next version of, I guess, Solidity, or the successor, is basically is based off of Python. Um, but it has a lot of safety built in. And we'll, we'll be covering that around the end of this uh, DAP segment, which will be week five. You can also have very, very careful programmers write code on this platform, but if the founders of Ethereum are also screening up, then who knows who's the most careful programmer for this kind of code. So that's it. That's all for Smart Contract Security, guys. Have a good weekend. Yeah, that's it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> There's, uh, it gets a lot deeper and it gets a lot more trickier. It's not that simple. So to start, um, I like to introduce an interesting bug that uh, comes up pretty frequently in smart contracts. Uh, something called integer overflow. Uh, basically, Solidity can handle up to 256-bit numbers. <laughs> Um, so suppose you have a unsigned int, and it's at its max value. And if you increment it by one, as you see here, it'll it'll turn to zero. Uh, why is that? Can anybody explain like why that's happening? Well, basically, 
when you, when you reach the maximum limit, um, what happens if you like end up incrementing something? What, it, when is, what ends up happening is uh, your integer overflows and it wraps around and it becomes uh, it becomes the next number, which is basically zero. Um, yeah. So if you look here, odometers actually work this way. Um, if if uh, if it reaches the maximum reading, and you know if it goes past that, it'll uh, it'll revert to zero. <laughs> so uh, maybe if you drive your car enough, you can uh, you can sell it you can sell it without getting arrested because people <laughs> will often like tamper with this and uh, yeah it's illegal so don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Do it the legit way. Uh, there's integer underflow, and this is much more common. Uh, basically, when the number's unsigned, uh, and you're decrementing uh, zero, you get the maximum possible value. Now, who can explain why this might be a great thing for you? Why, why might this be really good? You have zero money. You have zero exactly, money. right? So you have zero money. You know, you, if uh, you can get the contract to somehow subtract one, uh, next thing you know, you're like the richest guy on the planet. <laughs> That's only if the contract can pay out to you. So you're probably not going to be the richest guy on the planet. Yeah? So wait, is it not like in two complement form, or is it just unsigned? It's unsigned. This only happens with unsigned. Yeah. You can also have regular ints, which, which is also uh, two complements. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Um, so yeah, both cases are very dangerous, but like I said, the underflow is more, more likely to happen. Uh, so let's have an example here. Suppose a token holder has x tokens, but it uh, attempts to spend x plus 1. If the code doesn't check for it, the attacker may end up being allowed to spend more tokens than he had, and his balance underflows to the max integer. Uh, so how do, you, how do you fix this? There's something called Open Zeppelin Safe Math, and I'd like to show you uh, kind of how that works. So let's, uh, let's go to this demo here. And uh, let me increase the size of this so that it's pretty visible. But basically, um, so this is the safe math library. And if you look here, uh, we have add. Uh, we have like a separate add function instead of using uh, plus. Um, basically, we assert that C is greater than equal to A, who can tell me why we do this, right? If our inputs are in B and we're calculating C equals A plus B, why would we assert that C is greater than equal to A? Well, they're unsigned integers, so you can't have the, you can't make the addition of more C be less than A. Yeah, exactly. So you're basically just checking that C is greater than A because uh, you want to make sure that you're not overflowing. Uh, because if you overflow, right, it'll wrap around, it'll turn to zero, uh, you've lost all your amount. So let's see if I can, uh, let's see if I can deploy and kind of uh, run through an example. Um, let's see, so I will do, I'll do safe math first. I'll deploy it here, and then I'll deploy my other contract. I'll deploy it here. All right. If I call, I call uh, max, so to the max, and I call overflow, uh, instead of ending up at zero, instead of my max going to zero, uh, it pops up with an invalid opcode because uh, it, asserted, it asserted that, um, it basically just hit the assert statement here, right? So that's all that happened. Uh, same goes for underflow, um, another invalid opcode because uh, in this case, uh, we're, we're subbing, and what we check for is b is less than or equal to a. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, yeah. So by checking like that one of the inputs is less than uh, the other input, uh, basically you determine uh, you basically determine whether or not it'll underflow. So. See if I can go back into this. So I'd like to go over visibility. I, I think you may have seen this in lab, but uh, I think it's important to reiterate because we'll be going into some attacks that cover this. Uh, but basically, uh, public functions, they can be called by anybody. Uh, so that means functions inside the contract, functions uh, from inherited contracts, or by outside users. 
Uh, external functions can then be accessed externally by other contracts. So they cannot be called by other functions of the contract, and they're not visible to the contract itself. Uh, it's cheaper to use because it uses the call data opcode, while public uh, needs to copy all our uses of memory. There is kind of a reading on this if you want to check that out uh, much more in depth than we want to go about this. Um, and then private functions, they can only be called from inside the contract. And internal functions, they're like private functions, but uh, contracts that inherit from the parent contract are able to use uh, this internal function, whereas private is going to be restricted to that contract solely. So conclusion here is remember to keep your functions private or internal unless there is a need for outside interaction. That leads me to the fallback function. Uh, basically, there's a function uh, in a contract that's unnamed, and a contract can have exactly one of these. Uh, and this function cannot have arguments, and it just can't return anything. So this function is executed on a call to the contract if none of the other functions uh, match the given function identifier. So if you so if you like try to call something, uh, like say you type in some gibberish like function call to the to the contract. Um, this will just be like what it falls back on. Um, or if no data was supplied at all, it'll also, uh, it'll also like fall back to this. So anything that's like an invalid like function identifier, um, it'll fall back. Isn't that even the call like if you have the function overloading? If you have a defined function where there are two parameters, <laughs> but you're passing three parameters, so will that invoke this function as well? Uh, that's a good question. I, I believe so. Uh, I have to double check on that one, but I believe it will. Um, mainly because uh, it wouldn't match, because that function would not match the identifier, and therefore it would fall back. Yeah? Same thing happens if you say uh, a function that can't stay. Yeah. Yeah, to receive. Like a catching exception? Yeah. You can think of it as like a universal exception, which can be like dangerous or better depending on how you look at it. Uh, yeah. So to receive ether as uh, for this function, you need to mark it as payable. So you know if people are sending ether to your contract and you want to, uh, if, you, if you want them to be able to uh, fall back with it, um, basically you can you can like claim their ether this way if, if they if they call the wrong function as like punishment if you want to do that. Uh, other ways like if you were to send it to the fallback uh, that those funds uh, may not be uh, returned to the sender. So even though the fallback function cannot have arguments, uh, someone can still use message.data to retrieve any payload supplied with the call. I'll show you what that means, basically. Um, there's something called like delegate call, which will allow you to like take uh, message.data and like find a function identifier uh, from user input and then use that to call another function. And this is kind of like a hacky way uh, to do like function calls within the fallback function, uh, despite being like an extremely dangerous thing to do. So that leads me to delegate call. Um, basically, delegate call is identical to a message call, except uh, the code at the target address, it's going to be executed uh, within the scope of the calling contract and message.sender and message.value will not change their values. Does that make sense? Okay. So yeah, executed in the context of the calling contract. So if it's executed in the context of the calling contract, that means when I delegate call to another contract, I take the contract, the current contract's context, I move that basically into the function call of the other contract's uh, function. And that's where I will execute all my manipulations on my state for the uh, callee contract. Um, and yeah, that's why you would like delegate call. So what you can also do with delegate call is you can also load code from a different address, uh, which is kind of dangerous. Uh, there's a reason why you're not uh, supposed to be making uh, function calls within the fallback function uh, using this, and a lot of people will do this pretty often. But in other cases, it's completely fine to use delegate call um, within like normal functions. Just don't uh, use it within fallback functions. Um, 
Um, so this is very useful for implementing libraries and modularizing, modularizing your code. Uh, so if you're like writing a very complicated multi-signature wallet, you probably want to split up your components and start making calls to other contracts while like taking the scope of one contract and uh, like transferring it over to like a function call within another. It's kind of just like a way of using a library. Uh, but this also opens doors to a lot of vulnerabilities because uh, your contract is basically saying uh, do whatever I do whatever you want with my state and I trust you that you will uh, be honest with your function calls that happen in your contract. So that's like a very important thing to know, especially if you're relying on someone's someone else's code that you, you aren't aware of and how it works and such. So here's an example of delegate call. I have contract D&E, &E, uh, very simple um, function set n, which basically just uh, takes n and it sets it sets it to whatever the input is, and uh, it just sets uh, the sender to message us sender. Basically, uh, if I delegate call, tell me tell me what happens. What happens if I delegate call to that function? Who's, uh, who's n and sender ends up changing? Is it contract E's n and sender, or is it contract E's n and sender? Any ideas? Yeah, it's contract E's. It's because the scope of contract D was basically just transferred within contract E for that moment of time where the function call was happening. And then uh, when the function finishes executing, the scope of D is like finally modified. Let's go through, uh, let's go through another demo. Yeah, so this one is uh, this one's kind of a hack you can do with delegate call. Um, basically, let me let me zoom this in a bit. So that, yeah. Is it pretty visible on screen? You guys see that? Is it good? Yeah, sure. Is that good? All right. <coughs> um, so we have two contracts. We have contract delegate. Um, basically, it's a very simple contract. It, has this pawn function which you can ignore for now uh, because all it does is it sets the owner to message on sender. But you can start thinking about why this might be dangerous for a delegate call. Um, all it does is it sets the owner to whatever uh, is inputted in the constructor. Um, delegation, on the other hand, is where the delegates go. Um, and basically, the delegation has a selected delegate um, and the owner is sent to message on sender. Uh, so let's um, let's compile this in. Let's uh, maybe try running this and see what happens. You know, I'm always scared that uh, that these things they just won't run during the during this. <laughs> okay, let's create a let's create a delegate. Um, so let's see, um, and let's create a delegation, and it'll select the delegate that we. Uh, basically deployed. Um, so let's check the owner. Okay. Uh, and then let's check the owner of this. So you see they're different. Um, so how would I get the function, how would I get this to basically call pawn? If you see here, here's the fallback function. Uh, remember when it's called, right? It's called whenever somebody just sends in whatever function uh, like function identifier that's not currently defined within the contract, right? So here, uh, we only have the constructor, so if you assume that people are just sending uh, like function calls to this contract for whatever reason, an attacker could simply trigger this function. Um, what happens is then uh, the delegate uh, is then making a delegate call to message dot, uh, using message.data and message.data can point to uh, this function, uh, this function identifier. Why is that dangerous? If you see here, owner is set to message.sender. If we delegate call within the scope of delegation, we're basically taking the scope of delegation, right? So that includes owner and delegate, and 
we're taking it here, we're putting it in here inside the delegate, uh, I guess, instance, um, and we're running the pawn function, right? And we're, what are we doing? We are basically setting the owner of the delegate, uh, sorry, the owner of the delegation to the owner of delegate, right? We're completely, we're completely destroying this, this, uh, the ownership of the delegation contract. So if the delegate's able to take over the delegation, you can see why this could be a very dangerous outcome in, uh, in like a real world, like, I guess, uh, delegation like type contract, right? What would you put in message.data? Would, would it be like a pointer to or like what would Yeah, you so message.data would take in like a function identifier. Okay. I'll, uh, I believe I have a slide that'll kind of show like what it looks like. Um, yeah. Good question though. So yeah, um, so with delegate call, it briefly we talked about uh, the infamous parity hack. Uh, this happened when me and Nick uh, went to Cornell last year for like a blockchain bootcamp, and we met some very interesting people who were like into this stuff. But basically, um, the parity hack uh, it involved visibility modifiers and misuse of delegate call uh, with arbitrary data. And the vulnerable contracts function, it implemented delegate call and a function from another contract uh, that could modify ownership. That was made public. Um, so this allowed the attacker to craft message, uh, the message.data field uh, to call that vulnerable function. And you know, what would you put in here? You would put the function, you put the function signature. Uh, basically, a function signature in this case is uh, the first first eight bytes of SHA three. Uh, of the hash of like the function prototype. And I'll show you like an example of what that looks like. But uh, if you see where this is going, uh, basically like if the attacker is able to like uh, uh, point to um, a vulnerable function within the code and delegate call and start to change like, uh, uh, like internal variables like we did in this demo back here, uh, you can see that ownership can be changed and people can start stealing uh, people's user. So it's a very similar attack. Um, and you can see here that this is kind of like an example of what like the function, uh, the function like uh, signature would look like if you want to like point to it in the case of uh, message.data. This is what like would go in there. And there's a way to get this pretty easily in, uh, in that solidity. You run like similar commands. Uh, this is like the this is like the Ethereum API in JavaScript, but um, basically you would like run SHA three on like on like the function itself, and uh, you would uh, you'd basically slice it, and then you would put it inside uh, message data. So with delete call, I think it's important to look at other calls and like kind of prepare uh, where they're coming from. Um, so remember that delegate call basically says, I'm a contract and I'm allowing you to do whatever you want with my storage. This is a huge security risk because that person, uh, the, the sending contract needs to trust the receiving contract will treat the storage of the sending contract well. Call code does the same thing, but it did not preserve message.sender and message.value. So if Alice invokes Bob who does delegate call uh, to Charlie, the message.sender and the delegate call is Alice. If call code was used, the message.sender would be Bob. Call is then the basic way to call code from other contracts, except state is used within the call contract, right? We're not like delegating uh, our calls to another contract and moving our state of the current contract to that, uh, that function call. We're simply just remaining within uh, the scope of that contract that we call. So this leads me to what is called a re-entry attack. Um, to clarify, Solidity's call function, when called with a value, uh, forwards all the gas it receives uh, for like that transaction you send. Um, so let's look at the snippet below. Um, basically, the call that we make, uh, which is under dot, uh, this, this balance check, we're seeing if the balance of the message dot sender is greater than uh, the selected uh, withdraw amount. Um, you know, if it's greater than that, uh, what do we do? 
when we withdraw. We we don't end up uh, we don't end up sending them the money, right? Or do we? We do send we do end up sending the money. Um, so basically, uh, we we use this function message.sender.call. Um, and here's the problem, though. If you look at the code, um, before I uh, basically uh, reduce the balance of the message.sender, I basically uh, make a call that uh, <coughs> says, OK, um, give, me the, give me the money. Uh, like, let me withdraw the money and send it to my account. Uh, and then like uh, lower the balance. So imagine like a bank teller like giving you money before like subtracting like the balance, right? Um, there's like this wise quote made made by this Reddit commenter I found on R slash Ethereum. But uh, basically, you can think of just like someone trying to keep on withdrawing while the bank teller is like still trying to subtract the balance, right? And this this is dangerous for obvious reasons. But basically, the solution to this. You reduce the sender's balance before making the transfer of the value, right? So if you reduce the balance, then there's then there's no like fault in terms of uh, like sending sending money before it's been accounted for. Um, you can use mutexes to mitigate race conditions. All this is is like you set a lock when you like um, when you like decide to uh, like enter this withdraw function. So when you're withdrawing money. Uh, only one person at a time can like do this, and only one function call at a time can like end up doing this. And when you completely go through this, it unlocks. So it's like atomic in a sense, right? It has to run through all the instructions uh, before like it it like uh, lets other people start running things. And there's solution three, which is to use require message uh, transfer value. Uh, what what transfer does is basically it uh, it basically just tells you uh, whether or not, uh, I guess, the uh, balances are correct. So you don't really need to like start messing so much with balances uh, anymore. Because if you can transfer, um, then the balances are uh, automatically checked for. They're automatically accounted for. And the re require statement simply, uh, it's very similar to an assert in the sense that if it fails, um, then the function will fail, and uh, the remaining ETH slash uh, like state is reverted. We'll kind of talk about what's the difference between revert, require, assert. There's all these keywords that you might be seeing, but uh, that'll be like covered later in this. Another attack is forcing Ether to a contract. Um, this is using uh, Solidity's self-destruct function. Uh, so what self-destruct does is it's the only way to destroy a contract on Ethereum. Uh, it renders the contract useless, and it deletes the bytecode at that address, and it sends all the funds to a target address. So actually one of the inputs uh, to self-destruct is a target address. Um, because you can imagine if somebody like ends up calling this function, they obviously want to send all the remaining funds within this contract to someone's address. But there's a special case here. And that is if the receiving contract, uh, sorry, the receiving address is a contract, the fallback function does not get executed, which is uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and you'll see why this like can be a problem. But you know, if there's a conditional statement that depends on the contract <laughs> being uh, the balance being below a certain amount, uh, this can be potentially bypassed. Let's take a look at force ether. Um, basically, there's bool you win equals false. There's a function that uh, requires that the balance is greater than zero. Um, if the balance is not zero, basically, you win is set to true. And uh, if any other ether is received, it goes to the fallback function, and we call revert. So because of the throwing fallback function, normally, the contract won't be able to receive ether. but if this contract uh, self if a contract self destructs with uh, this contract as a target, the function uh, sorry the fallback function it does not get called, um, and as a result, this contract's balance 
uh, becomes greater than zero. And now uh, the person can bypass the require statement in only non-zero balance. So this person, by self-destructing uh, another contract, managed to send ether to this force ether contract and basically got past this guard condition, uh, require this balance greater than zero, and managed to cause some execution to happen. Uh, now this can definitely be dangerous. Uh, if you use your contract balance as a guard, somebody can just force ether into it using self-destruct. And remember, balance is kind of like one of those global variables for like the contract. So uh, every single contract has like balance. There's no way to like stop someone from, uh, I guess, like knowing or, well, you can you can kind of like set a fallback function and prevent people from inserting balance in somehow. But <laughs> there's no like real way to prevent people from looking at balance and stuff like that. Uh, there's also another attack. This is called denial of service with unexpected revert. Uh, and there's this there's this uh, there's interesting smart contract called King of Ether, King of the Ether on Ethereum. It's been around for a while. Uh, the principle is like this. Basically, you want to be if you want to be the king of the throne of this contract, uh, you pay some you pay like the designated amount that's been listed on uh, on like the contract. So in this case, 10 ETH. You send 10 ETH to be the king. Um, then you're added to this thing called the Hall of Monarchs. Which sounds really stupid, I know. This is actually a very like dumb contract. Uh, then the contract will send you your 10 ETH. Uh, and it's going to be a little less due to commission because developers like to make money. Uh, but uh, your 10 ETH will go to the monarch you usurped as compensation to them, which is why people might do this. Um, so then the price to claim this throne goes up by 33%. Uh, to 13, about around 13 ETH, and it stops at 100,000 ETH for, for safety reasons, as the developers say. Um, but basically, if someone comes along who's willing to pay this amount, <laughs> you'll make money by like putting money in. So you're kind of like betting that you're you're hoping that someone just comes in and tries to like become king uh, after you, because if they, if uh, if someone doesn't come in within 14 days, your monarchy is like dead, and then the whole thing like resets. So it's like a really stupid gambling contract almost. Um, so I'd like to go through a demo again. That is a good question. I just like um, I think it's because when you self-destruct, it's it's very much a dangerous thing to do, <coughs> and. Uh, I guess they wanted to like force balance to like go to, to go to the contract because when you self destruct, um, it doesn't like check. There's no way to like for the for the self destructing contract to check <coughs> if the other contract is like accepting like your balance or not, right? There's no way for for that contract to check the other contract and say, oh, this person is accepting balances or not. So this is why like the self destruct function just says, okay, fuck it. I'm gonna like pretend there's no there's no like fallback function. And I'm going to like bypass all of that, and then I'm going to give you the ether because I, I need to self-destruct now, and there's no way for me to know that you're going to like like stop me from taking ether from your from your like fallback functions or whatever functions you have in place to stop me. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's there's this contract called called to the unknown, um, and basically the highest bidder becomes the leader, like in King of the Hill or king, king of the ether. Um, so uh, we have an address that has a current leader. We have the highest bid that's being keep, kept track of. And this is being run in a, uh, in a uh, fallback function, which is kind of uh, sketchy. But uh, for, for example purposes, uh, we'll, we'll do it this way. Um, then we have a contract called pawn. Um, and this contract is like, you can think of it as like a user just trying to uh, play around, mess with, mess with uh, this guy's like system. Uh, so pawn uh, basically has a function called become leader, um, and all it does is it, uh, it it takes in like the address of the call to the unknown contract, uh, and it takes in a bid amount, and it sends a bid to uh, to uh, this this guy here. Um, so by doing call that value. It goes to the uh, it goes to this fallback function, 
and uh, we, we check for the message.value being higher than the highest bid, message.value being this bid amount, um, and then we also require that the current uh, we require that the current leader uh, sends sends the highest bid. So you're from you're from the old leader. If it fails, then you revert. Um, so one, once these checks go by, then uh, you set the new current leader. You set the new highest bid, and uh, there's your there's your new leader. Um, so where do you see this going wrong? Can anybody tell me where you might see this going wrong? Okay, so uh, Um, not quite. Um, any other thoughts? Okay. Um, basically, this DOS attack is going to be one that causes all transactions to revert. Why does that happen? Uh, it's because when you, uh, when, when this pawn contract becomes the leader, um, what happens when you try, when the next leader tries to send it Ether. Basically, <coughs> what happens is it ends up reverting uh, all the time, <coughs> right? It's because um, you know when you set the current leader here, and uh, current leader, uh, we have this require statement called current leader send highest bid. Um, what ends up happening is any time that this guy like tries to receive ether uh, from taking over from uh, basically like taking over. And getting or getting refunded, uh, this require statement will fail, right? So remember that when somebody like takes over the throne, that person, uh, the previous throne holder, gets refunded. And th in this case, if the pr if the previous phone hol uh, throne holder it has a uh, fallback function that causes it to revert, um, that those funds can't be sent back. And what happens is it just reverts. So that means this guy's just like stuck here, sitting on the throne, and and they can't do they can't do shit about it. So he's, yeah, he's basically like destroyed the system. So yeah, uh, permanent denial of service, rendering it useless, um, which is pretty interesting. Uh, so the next attack, which is also uh, a cool one, is the short address attack, and uh, I believe a lot of money has been like made off of this one. Uh, Basically, uh, there's something called the ERC20. We'll talk about that in the next lecture. Um, but it's a token, it's a standard token contract that people use as like a spec for like building out uh, different ICOs, different, different like uh, interesting tokens that they do these days. Um, so all this attack is, is you're allowed to withdraw a larger amount than you're actually allowed to. Uh, so let's, let's suppose we have an exchange with uh, with a wallet that has 1,000 tokens, and the user has 32 tokens, and the user address is just uh, 0x123456600. Uh, keep an eye on the trailing zeros, that'll become pretty important. You'll see why this is called the short address attack. Um, so suppose the user wants to withdraw an amount larger than their balance. They go to the exchange, they click the token withdraw button, and they input their address without uh, without the trailing zeros, right? So they just strip off this, these two, these two zeros right here, and uh, because the exchange doesn't perform input validation, and let and uh, it just lets the transaction go through uh, despite this invalid uh, uh, address length. So that that has actually happened before. So what happens is the EVM then calculates the input data for the transaction, and that is by concatenating function signature with the arguments. So remember what that fun uh, function signature looked like. You know, if you run web3.sha3 .sha um, and you put inside uh, the transfer function with these two uh, arguments, this is like the function like um, function like name slash uh, descriptor, I guess is the best way to call it. Uh, and then what you get out from that is you get the signature, which is like this uh, deterministic number that will link to that uh, that function, and then um, the other uh, the other two fields you have your you have your two arguments that were inputted, 
as a result. Um, so you have the receiving address, uh, and then you have 32, which was the user's balance, right? And he wants to withdraw that 32. Um, so once you, uh, uh, bas basically what happens with EBM is like one, once you call this function, it gets concatenated into these three things. This is signature, this is the arg, this is arg1, which is the receiving address that he transfers to. This is arg2, which is the, uh, this is the amount that he wants to withdraw. And it looks a little like this, um, this hexadecimal here. So um, we have this here, right? Our normal, our normal looking like hexadecimal, uh, hexadecimal like transaction input data. So what happens in the EVM is that it notices, oh, I'm missing, I'm missing two zeros. Uh, it's just going to add on two zeros. It's going to pad it since it's two by shorter. Um, and what's going to happen is uh, this is actually going to be what the argument uh, is. And this person is now going to have uh, 8,192E, which if you multiply by 1,000, that's a lot of money, guys. That's like eight, that's $8 million. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. So damn, he's rich, right? Now you mitigate this. You throw if message.data has an invalid size. Uh, or uh, exchanges must perform input validation. So what do I mean by throwing if message.data has an invalid size? Uh, I mean that if in the transfer function uh, for ERC20, if somebody inputs like an address shorter than it should be, uh, it should be checked for. And at the moment, uh, the size is not being checked for, as far as, I, as far as I know. I think maybe the newer specs might be, might be doing something like that. But in, in the case of ERC20, it does not check if message.data has invalid size. So that means the exchanges are left to burden with this. So that leaves us kind of like halfway, uh, or more than halfway. Um, you can sign in here. Um, code is underflow. Everybody get a chance to type in the code in the URL. We good? All right. Cool. I guess uh, I guess we we'll get back to it then. So uh, there are some quirks about fluidity that I'd like to cover that uh, we may have not covered yet, and I don't really think they fit under the previous discussion we had. Uh, but basically, uh, you might have heard of like randomness generation, um, and this is pretty difficult to achieve. Everything on the EVM is basically deterministic. Um, and people have tried to use now and block that block hash for uh, business logic in a contract, but the results are predictable and they can be manipulated by miners. Uh, there's something called timestamp dependence, which is like what this attack would be. Um, so yeah, like you can also use block numbers and average block time to then estimate time. Uh, this is not necessarily like a future-proof way to attack the system, but uh, since since things might change, but it certainly is right now. Um, because, you know, Ethereum's block time is like, what, 12 seconds, something like that. And if you know, like, the block numbers, you can, you can pretty much, like, estimate, like, what the, what the block time uh, would be. There's also, like, interesting articles on how, like, generate uh, random numbers in your smart contract because uh, there is some, like, random stuff that needs to be done. Uh, well, it's actually more client side than it is uh, application side. Uh, Anybody ever wonder how they do like SHA-3 on like, uh, on like Ethereum smart contracts? Anybody in like 161? Maybe, have, maybe uh, throw out some ideas. How, how do you think they might do uh, like their hashes? You, need, you usually need some like source of randomness, right? Where might that source of randomness come from? So the source of randomness would actually come from like the Ethereum clients. Um, so that includes like Geth, Parity, like those guys like 
there, there's like specs for writing an Ethereum client, and one of the things is you need to be able to uh, like generate these hashes, um, and that's all it's doing. It's, it's getting it from the Ethereum clients themselves. So there's some general things that you should do towards security. Um, don't write fancy code. Like simple is way better. Um, a lot of the like bugs you saw like previously were in much more like complicated uh, usage. So like the the demos I showed were very very simplified versions of like what the code like actually is for when these things go wrong. Uh, use audited and tested code. Uh, there's a lot of libraries out there like Open Zeppelin. Uh, they have a lot of like generic libraries that you can use in order to write uh, your secure like DAP or like smart contract platform or whatever you want. Uh, it's been like very well audited, very well tested. That's an option. But you should also like pay people to audit, especially if you do like an ICO. This is like very, very common. Write as many unit tests as possible. Um, you know, we're gonna get into testing like after this unit uh, because it does kind of like jump off the security. It is important for like knowing what kind of outputs uh, what kind of input should result in what kind of output for your functions. Uh, you should prepare for failure any, at any moment in any contract or method, right? Because, you know, if things go wrong, uh, you should have, like, a fallback way to, like, deal with it. Um, so, like, suppose, like, somebody decides to, uh, suppose you find a bug in your contract and you need to figure out a way to, uh, like, uh, deploy the new contract. Uh, there are ways to do this. Um, one way, one way to do it, uh, which I won't really cover here, is to create a smart contract that manages the instances of uh, other deployed contracts. And simply uh, by by doing that, if you have a contract that manages other contracts, you can force then the users to uh, update their smart contract instances, um, if that makes sense. Or you can make it at least very easy to. You should also roll out carefully. So, you know, do your bug bounties before the ICO, not not after the ICO, in the sense that if somebody hacks it, they're going to get a lot more money from you actually if you just pay them the bug bounty. Uh, but at the same time, they might go to prison. So, like, there's a there's like a trade off there. So, uh, you should also keep contracts uh, simple because you can have a lot more attack vectors with the more complexity you have. Uh, and you should. Stay up to date with software and the community because this stuff keeps changing. You know, if you, for example, if you do, uh, if you select like a later Solidity version, like after coding it in a very earlier Solidity version, that would be problematic because things often change in Solidity a lot. So if I were to decide to use like 4.0.1 versus 4.2 or something like that, uh, that would like be a major, major difference. So that's like not a good idea. Uh, and you should also remember blockchain properties, uh, whether or not it's public or private. Um, you should also remember like certain function calls, like send versus call. So what I mean by public versus private, by the way, is like you can actually run private instances of Ethereum. Uh, what was happening when I ran the uh, demos was whenever I deployed, I wasn't deploying on the Ethereum network, right? That would be that'd be pretty slow and dumb. What they do is they, they host like a private network within uh, their own backend, and they let you deploy contracts to that and start poking around with them there because it's much quicker for them to deal with the centralized infrastructure, and it's completely free. It's costless, right? Uh, so external calls, uh, I mean, we talked about delegate calls, and we talked about call codes and, and uh, regular calls, but basically uh, you want to avoid these as much as possible because Whenever you make these, you are uh, you are putting a lot of trust inside another contract that could potentially go wrong. And that's not to say that uh, you should include all your code within one contract, but generally when you use delegate call, which is the most dangerous one of all, as I showed you in the example, um, that's when things are prone to go wrong because you're moving your scope, you're, you're trusting it in the hands of another contract that uh, could potentially be poked at with, because it has public functions in it. And then uh, some like user on the outside could be like, oh, I I, I can like uh, I can like take your scope from this other func from this other contract that's very important to you, and then by moving it into this other contract, I can uh, I can maybe take ownership or I can I can like start to mess you mess with your balances and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, like we talked about uh, the parity multi-signature wallet hack, but there's also the DAO hack, which was. Uh, also had problems with external calls, which is why it happened. 
Okay, so send versus call that value. Um, you should always use send or transfer over call that value. So you saw in those previous ones that I was using uh, call that value. I believe it was, um, what was the example? I believe it was the re entrancy exploit uh, where we didn't check the balance. Um, on the on the bank where you could just keep withdrawing from the bank and they wouldn't account for like that until like uh, until it reached that line of code which it might not if somebody decides to like send multiple withdrawals. Um, so the reason why you should use send is because um, it will return a boolean of success uh, once once it happens and it's much more safer than call that value. Uh, transfer does a similar thing except. Uh, you don't manage. Uh, you don't manage the failures. Uh, whereas with uh, send, you do have to manage the failures uh, because all it does is it returns whether it succeeded or not. But suppose it didn't succeed. Um, you know, nothing like happens when it doesn't succeed. It only returns false when it doesn't succeed. In the sense of transfer, when it doesn't succeed, um, what happens is uh, it'll just uh, send the ether back to the person's address. So it has like added failure protection. Now for call, um, the problem with this is that because it's given all the available gas for execution, um, this is bad because you can do re-entrancy. Um, so you can keep on like withdrawing and pulling money uh, because you still have like you still have like the gas from that call in order to re-enter into the into the function code. There's also revert versus throw. Um, so you can think of the throw keyword as an alternative to revert, but uh, revert is kind of like taking over for the most part uh, because in Metropolis, uh, revert is going to return unused gas and throw will continue to consume all available gas. So it depends if you want to be mean or if you want to be nice. If somebody like sends to your fallback function and they're not supposed to be sending to your fallback function, uh, you can kind of choose if you want to throw or revert. Um, I'm not sure about the other cases as to why you would use throw versus revert, um, but yeah, in most cases use revert. Uh, so there's also require and assert. So require is going to be used for input validation, and it, and it should be done on any user input, uh, and you, it throws if the condition is false, but for assert, um, <laughs> This should only be used to check for contract internal state or uh, to check if your contract has reached a very invalid state, meaning that, uh, like overflow, for example, that's a very dangerous state to be in. That's when you want to uh, basically, uh, you know, sound the alarms, right? And that's what a server is used for. They do return different opcodes um, as well, so they can be like handled differently depending on how you write a smart contract code. Uh, so that's also a, like an interesting thing that you can do. Another thing you've probably seen Paragma Solidity. Uh, so it's bad to uh, basically set the Solidity version to greater than like what, uh, what the number is because new versions come out constantly. New versions can like break things as well. Uh, the, the good thing to do is write your code for a version and maintain it at that version. If you want to upgrade versions, you have to make sure to look over your code and make sure things don't break. But always like set your version firmly as a security caution. Rounding with integer division. So basically when you divide, uh, everything rounds down to the nearest in integer. Um, and there's a good reason for that, right? Somebody shouldn't be getting more ether than they're supposed to be getting uh, in some cases. Uh, so rounding down is like a safer uh, way of doing it. But um, suppose you want more precision. The way you do this is you basically need to store the denominator and the numerator. And you need to basically do like, uh, like manual fraction manipulation. So remember that all this data is public. Uh, on Ethereum, it's a public blockchain. Uh, so it's like you don't have any privacy with regards to what's posted on there. So if you post like an invalid, like a very, uh, I guess, insecure contract, like everybody's gonna see it. 
uh, and peop and if it's got a lot of money in it, everybody's gonna like start poking at it and start to drain it. Um, you can think of uh, whenever you build an application where privacy is an issue, you want to be careful uh, to avoid requiring users to publish any kind of information uh, too early in the game. So if we have an example, we have an example uh, like a rock paper scissors contract. Um, so basically, you have in this case you require both players to submit a hash of their intended move first, right? You want to make sure that. Their, uh, their moves are checked at the same time. Um, and then you're going to require both players uh, to submit their move. And if, there's, if their move does not match the hash, then you basically throw it out. It's kind of like, OK, so they submit a hash, then they confirm their move. And then if it doesn't match, you throw it out. So that, that ensures that you don't like show any information like too early in the process. Also, another thing, like if because this data is public, uh, you know you don't want your person to be able to see like what's uh, shown on chain. That's why we did the rock paper scissors rock paper scissors example. Uh, another example is uh, two party slash n party contracts. Uh, so, you were the possibility that some participants may drop offline and not return. So, if you make something like dependent on multiple parties, and uh, like let's say like. Uh, you have some kind of like betting thing where uh, people put in their money and it needs like a certain amount of people in order to uh, like start start like the distribution of the money. Suppose like uh, you, you like coordinated with some participants and somebody drops offline. Um, that means like you know everybody's like funds are frozen, they're stuck. Um, so uh, basically, for rock paper scissors, uh, you don't want to make a payout until uh, both players submit their moves. Um, and there's a pitfall of this where you know, a ma malicious player can end up griefing the other uh, by simply never submitting their move. Right? If they decide not to submit their move, then this game doesn't happen, and uh, maybe the other player ends up locked up. So the way you can like, uh, prevent this is maybe setting a time limit on the contract. Uh, so you know, once, like, once the time limit hits like, a certain point, uh, you know the the funds are like returned uh, to people. You can also add a some kind of economic incentive to submit information in uh, the situations they're supposed to be doing. So you can make them deposit their money, and if they uh, you can threaten to like slash their money in the case that uh, they don't like comply with your uh, regulation on the smart contract. Another thing, test driven development. Uh, that's pretty important for uh, smart contract security and uh, solidity in general. We're going to cover this in like the next lecture. And there's a bunch of cool tools that you can use to uh, audit and perform analysis. But one of the big things is uh, Sol C has like semantic checking, uh, which is like really helpful for looking at things uh, during compile time. Uh, oftentimes, you also see like linters that take advantage of this, like Solium or Solent. Uh, so if you have like Visual Studio Code and we're using like Truffle, uh, it's very good for like uh, uh, like catching bugs and like errors. Uh, there's all kinds of tools like Securify.ch, static analysis tool for smart contracts. You have Remix, which you guys have already seen. Um, it can do static analysis, but it can also spot uh, traditional bugs like uninitialized storage uh, and re entrancy attacks. Oyente is also another an analysis tool for smart contracts. I believe it's like uh, it does use formal verification. Uh, Hydra is a uh, security framework that you can use to like develop with. Uh, so if you can like import existing common smart contract things and uh, overwrite them. Uh, they might be like abstract contracts, or they might be like libraries that you can use. Um, there's Porosity. It's a decompiler for blockchain-based Ethereum smart contracts. Um, there's Manticore. It's a dynamic binary analysis tool, uh, and you can use it with EVM to like start looking through like what happens during execution. Uh, there's also Interplay, which is like uh, that's a binary ninja plugin. Binary ninja is just like another. Uh, binary analysis tool that you can use to like look at how EVM executes. Uh, one important one I think is Open Zeppelin. 
Uh, you can write very secure smart contracts on Ethereum by using this framework because it's been seen and used by so many people. People who like store millions of dollars and rely on these libraries. Um, so there's a lot of contracts. There's there's ownership ones. Uh, there's safe math. There's push and pull. Uh, those are probably those are pretty important ones because uh, you know d deposit and withdraw. Uh, they can be kind of tricky to uh, write securely. Uh, you have to like remember to use like transfer versus like call value. Um, you have standard and basic tokens, ERC20, which is ready out of the box. Um, yeah, some cool stuff there. And there's also solve graph, which generates a dot graph that visualizes function control flow of solidity contract and highlights any potential security vulnerabilities. So if you go to the GitHub, you basically just like run this on your solidity files and uh, it like maps it out as to like what are your dependencies. Uh, where there where there might be like potential uh, security vulnerabilities in your uh, smart contract code, so that way uh, it tells you like what to look at, uh, what to keep an eye out for, what someone should probably be auditing uh, when they look at some kind of uh, when they're performing some kind of a code audit for security reasons. So that leaves us with history. Uh, there's not a lot of time left, but I'll like kind of breeze through this quickly. Um, so how many of you have heard of the DAO? Okay. Does anybody like remember what it is? Does anyone want to like try to explain like what it did, like how it worked, like just in like very brief detail? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with like voting. Uh, I mean, it stands for decentralized autonomous or organization. What what, what might that entail? Okay. Um, basically, this allowed people. This allowed. Um, this allowed the raising of ether, and uh, you could basically vote on what uh, projects you like, and these would be projects that you could then fund through this DAO. Uh, so people would be like given membership by depositing funds in the DAO, and once they're given membership, they have votes, and uh, by then they can like vote on like projects they want to fund, kind of like a decentralized like venture capital type thing they're doing. So there was like. 3.6 million ether that was inside the DAO. And as you can imagine, that's like a lot more than it was today. Or sorry, it's a lot more today than it was back then. Um, so around then, $70 million. Uh, that's a lot, but not as much as it is now, right? Now it's worth like three three billion if, it, if the ETH is a thousand, right? <laughs> it's pretty crazy. So, uh, this much ether was drained by the attacker, uh, and he basically found an exploit in the splitting function, which is used to get away from people that you don't agree with in the DAO. So, like, uh, suppose like you're making a vote in the DAO, uh, if if you want to like split off from those people, you can like you can basically like split the DAO into like uh, different portions of people if other people agree to join you, uh, which is like interesting because this is like completely decentralized and. It's almost hard to like wrap wrap your mind around like what kind of like problems this could like potentially lead to uh, with like governance, like decentralized governance. But uh, anyway, the attackers then withdrew Ether from the DAO smart contract uh, using like the DAO tokens, and he was using the reentry exploit that we kind of talked about earlier. So this exploit was pretty simple. Um, honestly, I won't go too too deep into it because I don't think it's Super important to like, like know the nitty gritty details. But we saw the reentry exploit. That's basically like what happened. Uh, so the result of the attack ended up with something called Ethereum Classic. Uh, how many of you have heard of Ethereum Classic and kind of wondered what it was? Okay. Yeah, this was like the this was like basically uh, the original Ethereum. Uh, and because there was this attack. Uh, back in the day, it was like so severe of an attack. Like most of the people who were using Ethereum had probably put in funds in the DAO at that time, and uh, because it was so big, and because the Ethereum Foundation was like uh, a big party in like funding this, um, you know, they ended up hard forking. So what that means is they, they ended up going through the data, uh, like the the blockchain data, they ended up looking for the blocks for uh, where the DAO was like. Uh, drained, 
and they basically just got rid of those, like, uh, got rid of the drainage, like, completely. So they completely wiped history. And there's a lot of debate as to why this is a good or bad thing. Uh, there's a lot of, like, die-hard Ethereum Classic supporters who believe that blockchain should not be, be able to be manipulated by a single party, such as the Ethereum Foundation. But at the same time, the Ethereum Foundation did, like, save future developments of this platform because, you know, this, this much Ether, 3.6 million, was, like, like, so much of the Ether at the time uh, that it would be a detrimental if, like, one hacker had access to all this Ether. Still have the money. He just didn't share that. Yeah, so he was on Ethereum Classic, uh, and basically, that doesn't mean he didn't do anything with it. Actually, what ended up happening was he took the money over to Shapeshift, which is like, uh, it's a platform by, I forget his name, Eric Verhees or something like that, but basically, he's like, uh, he, he built like this service that lets you like take like multiple cryptocurrencies, like one of your choice. Uh, and you can just like shift it into like another currency. Uh, now they don't give you the best exchange rate, of course, but because it's so instant, yeah. like it's very powerful, um, and they don't keep track of like who's sh shifting what uh, because that's like against their policy. So the DAO hacker managed to like shape shift their funds. Uh, so he could spend all of it in like here, like not he wasn't even like. So, so yeah, you could like shift it into like some kind of privacy crypto. Nobody knows what he shifted it into because Shapeshift doesn't keep the data. But I, I'm sure they like know. I'm sure like if Shapeshift like looked through their logs of how much money was like transferred between this time and this time, they could they could they could piece it together. Uh, and the thing is like everybody knew the DAO hacker's address, right? So it's like not a big deal. Like if if they knew like which address like pointed to the person's ETH. Um, the biggest deal is when like the DAO hacker tries to take the take like the majority of ether like like in the whole ecosystem yeah. and tries to uh, make exchanges for it. Because if, if ETH loses, ETH is gonna lose most of its value because it belongs to a hacker and now everybody's gonna probably believe it's like bullshit, right? Um, so that means like, uh, it's actually not as simple as it seems to just uh, like shapeshift into, um, shapeshift into like another crypto and then take it to USD. Uh, because there has to be like, a, there has to be like you can imagine it's really hard to find liquidity for like that much ETH, right? Especially in a time during the hacking. What's up? Especially if you're the only one that has all that ETH. Exactly. And uh, but there, but I mean, he managed to do it. Um, I'm not sure how. Like maybe he like maybe he like inserted like multiple small like portions of his ETH slowly through Shapeshift, and eventually like he he got it out into other crypto. Uh, he does it uh, that way um, because. Then he can piece it into like different uh, cryptocurrencies and a diversified portfolio all of a sudden from his from his ETH. But the conclusion from this is, um, you know, he actually only took one third of the DAO's funds. Uh, he didn't take all of them. Uh, so he actually ran. So the so the DAO itself like it ran out of gas to like siphon uh, any more funds. Um, so that means. Uh, they could not like withdraw anything like more from the DAO. It was no, like that was that was as much as they could take out. Um, so the SEC then like ruled that the DAO may have been in violation of the securities law. They've been very cryptic about uh, this whole stuff in general. And uh, yeah, so he managed to cash out on ETC, uh, which is why ETC is like not nearly as valuable as ETH today. Only because it's not being like developed like ETH to like the leaders of the ecosystem right now in the hands of like people who didn't like make Ethereum. It's in the hands of people who are just like crypto crazy slash like very, very privacy or uh, very like immutable blockchain centric people. Uh, so yeah, progress is not like happening usually on that front. So I'm gonna stop here uh, because this is all interesting history and stuff, but um, I think you guys can like read about it. We'll post readings. Yeah, so uh, for next week, we're going to be talking about um, tokens and uh, hopefully covering some Web3 and some testing. So yeah, we'll see you guys, uh, we'll see you guys next week.